What we're going to run you through is the anatomy of the eye, very briefly, very simply. Um, the reason for doing this is diabetes actually uniquely affects the eye because it is such a complex organ and it has such a large blood supply. Um, we're going to take you through the sorts of things that can go wrong, um, how do you keep them healthy, um, and when you go and see a healthcare professional we, um, investigating the health of your eyes in relation to diabetes, what should you should actually expect to go on? Um, this is an eyeball cut in half. Not recommended. Um, <laughs> the, at the very front of the eye is the cornea. It's a, the clear tissue, you can't see it. It covers over the coloured part of the eye that's the, the iris. Just behind the iris is a natural lens called the crystalline lens, which focuses the light to the very back of the eye, the retina. Um, the retina, in the old days, I used to say the retina was like a film in the camera. Unfortunately, young people today have got no idea that cameras once had film. Um, so it, it's like the, the sensor in a digital camera. Um, and that's where the image is formed and, and transmitted to the brain. With diabetes, um, things can go wrong with virtually all of them. So, the, um, the spectrum of things that can go wrong is refractive change. Your vision goes blurry. With diabetes, if your blood sugar levels are, are uncontrolled, you'll go through periods of of your vision being indistinct and blurry and other times where it's good. And it can cycle over a period of hours. So um, as a practitioner, when a person comes in and says that their, their vision is unreliable, um, it is actually quite a concern in regards to diabetes. When I first started practicing and GPs weren't checking for blood sugar levels as frequently as they are now, it wasn't uncommon for my profession to actually send people to their GP to have a blood sugar check because of the fact that their, what they needed in glasses was changing so quickly. Um, diabetes can form, cause cataracts to form more frequently. Cataracts are an opacity in that natural lens inside the eye. At the very front surface of the eye, the cornea, you can, um, you can get little pits and transient damage to the front of the eye, which is really quite painful. Um, but that's also a consequence of diabetes. You can, um, there's a number of nerves that actually control the position of the eye, and they, they come straight from the brain, so they're called cranial nerves. Diabetes can actually impact on how well they work, and can cause double vision quite suddenly. In most cases, it resolves. Um, at the very back of the eye, diabetes can actually cause retinopathy, so that film in the camera starts to dysfunction. The other um, consequence of untreated diabetes can be glaucoma, which you may have heard about. With those last two, we don't actually expect people to know that anything's going on until it's actually quite advanced. So the blurred vision, um, and the reason why it's so transient is the natural lens inside our eye is like a bag of fluid. And it's fed by a, a fluid that's actually being filtered out of your blood and constantly being replaced at the front of the eye. So if that fluid that's being filtered out of your blood has a higher level of sugar in it, it actually changes the amount of fluid that's inside the bag. And it's how curved that bag is that determines what you need in glasses. So if your blood sugar levels are going up and down, what you need in glasses actually will change. Normally, um, people find that they go more short-sighted. So they can't see in the distance, but reading's easier. But if a person's been diabetic for a long period of time and their blood sugar levels have actually been consistently high and then they get on control, well, it can go back the other way. So the direction can be quite um, different. 
Um, it can change through the course of the day or it can change through the course of a week. Um, and if you see an optometrist, um, quite a number of my profession, especially if you report to us that your blood sugar control hasn't been all that great recently, quite often we will suggest that you, we don't sell you glasses today. We get you back in um, again and have another look to see is there fluctuation in the numbers. Because in this sort of circumstance, there is a, a chance that the numbers that we came, um, come up with on one day, by the time the glasses get, um, get to you a week later, are no longer correct. We don't always explain that all that well. Um, so like I said, the, a cataract is actually the lens inside the eye going hazy. This is caused by the same process as the fluctuating vision. The fluid coming in and out of the natural lens inside the eye creates the, the tissues of the lens to dysfunction and they actually start going hazy. So you start getting um, opacities and we all get cataracts eventually and that's this sort of cataract. But with poor glycemic control, poor, poor blood sugar control, the patterns are actually quite different. Um, in a normal eye, in a young normal eye, the lens is actually quite clear. Um, we've cheated with this photo. This person's actually had a um, cataract surgery and that's actually in the implant. Um, it's very hard to find people photographing healthy eyes. Um, so, poetic license, I believe it's called. Um, with cataracts, as you're probably all aware of, I would, would expect that quite a few people within the room have actually had cataract surgery. It's actually very simple to solve. Um, it's a surgery that everybody goes through eventually because everybody gets cataract. We just expect if you've had a period, a long period of poor blood sugar control, you're probably going to be lining up for cataract surgery earlier than your age colleagues. Um, This is the quite, the transient, quite painful thing that we, I was talking about earlier. The front surface of the eye has one of the highest densities of pain receiving nerve cells of any part of your body. So there doesn't have to be a lot going on for it to feel quite uncomfortable. Um, the very outermost layer of the cornea, the cornea has five layers. Um, in diabetes, it's more prone to actually parts of it falling off because it's not sticking down properly. So it's like somebody's attacked the front of the eye with a pin. Doesn't that sound like fun? Um, so it, the normal symptom associated with this, this can happen for other reasons apart from diabetes, but the normal symptom is, especially on waking, a, an atten intensely painful eye waters, but in about 10 or 15 minutes, it's actually settled down. Um, and the reason for it settling down is the cornea is actually one of the fastest healing tissues we've got in our body. With um, the level of damage on the surface of the eye is so small that apart from the watering of the eye, nobody's actually going to be able to see what's going on without magnification. So the reference that we've made to a slit lamp is that bulky magnifier that optometrists and some doctors have that you sit behind and they blind you with bright lights with. Um, so you really need quite a lot of magnification to actually see what's going on in these cases. So there are a number of cranial nerves. That's what these numbers refer to. Um, with Diabetes, because it affects the blood supply, you can have little changes to the blood supply of the root of the nerve. So quite spontaneously, a person will see two of everything because the eyes are actually no longer pointing in the same direction. Um, because this is something that can be caused by lots of other things happening inside your skull, we never assume that it's been caused by diabetes, although 
diabetes is one of the leading causes of this misdirection of the eyes. Um, when there's a diabetic cause for this change in um, nervous supply to the muscles of the eye, in most cases it resolves in a few months. So normally we don't do, um, don't do anything um, to actually correct it. We go really high tech and get people to wear a pirate patch. Um, if after six months it hasn't resolved, there are um, solutions within glasses and also su surgical solutions to actually get the two images to work together again. So this is what the, the back of the eye looks like. This is a retina. These are both two um, very healthy young retinas. Um, this one is from one of my 20-year-old students, so thankfully it's, it's healthy. Um, this pale area here is the optic nerve head. It's where all the, the nerves of the, the retina exit the eye and head towards the brain. This area here is your central vision. Um, it's the macula, and you may have heard of macular degeneration. So that's the part of the eye that's actually affected in that condition. So that's the area that's got the highest density of um, light receiving cells. So when you actually look, look at something, you move your eyes to look at something, you're actually pointing that part of the eye at what you want to look at. The further we get away from there, the less detail we have in our vision. These darker lines, thicker, darker lines are actually small veins and they're taking blood away from the eye. The finer ones that almost look hollow in places are small arteries and they're bringing blood into the eye. And with diabetes, where a lot of the changes are actually happening or are possibly going to happen in um, surveillance of the condition, early diagnosis, is actually looking at these blood vessels because it's the only place in the eye where we can actually inspect blood vessels without taking to you with something pointy. So those first two shots were the back 45 degrees of the eye. The retina, if you laid it out flat, flat it's about 170 degrees. So this particular device, um, made by this company, also I'm not sponsored by them, um, can take an image out to um, 110, 210 degrees. And there's a, a lot of commercial practices around Adelaide that will, will advertise ultra-wide imaging. This is the sort of image that they're actually obtaining. So, uh, diabetic retinopathy, so diabetes affecting the vision, is the largest cause of blindness in the Australian population below the age of 65. Above 65, it gets beaten to the mark by um, macular degeneration. Diabetes being a condition of blood and blood vessels, the genesis of diabetic retinopathy is basically the blood vessels not holding the blood in as, as well as it should. Inside the eye, because we've got such a thick layer of nerves, the best analogy is it's an electrical circuit. So the blood vessels need to release nutrients, but we don't want to spill water over the electrical circuit. So the vessels inside the eye are actually quite um, specialised and they're quite similar to the ones that are inside our brain, unlike the blood vessels of the rest of our body. Um, as we said earlier, with diabetic retinopathy, in the early stages, um, there aren't a lot of symptoms, um, if any. Um, it's only when it gets further down the track there are some very aged studies that say that we're not actually expecting changes with the retina in a person with diabetes until they've had diabetes for about 15 years. Um, 
and quite often you can have extensive changes inside the eye and still be seeing 2020, um, the, you know, the old standard of normal vision. Because we can actually inspect the blood vessels um, inside the retina, the things that we're, we're looking for is signs of leakage, um, signs of abnormality in the blood vessels, areas of retina that aren't actually getting enough blood, um, and in response to the eye not getting enough nutrition and enough oxygen, it actually starts producing new vessels. Um, I've just had a conversation with Joanne. Um, Joanne was talking about um, looking at ways to actually increase new blood vessel growth in limbs. In the eye, we're actually trying to prevent that. Um, and I'll explain why. Um, so, this is a photograph of a gentleman who was 42 um, that I saw. Um, this was his good eye. Um, so these little squiggly blood vessels here are actually new blood vessels that have been growing because the eye wasn't, the retina wasn't getting enough nutrition and enough oxygen. These red splodges here are blood that's actually leaked out of the blood vessels um, and it's all the components of the blood have leaked out. These paler specks are actually um, blood lipids and blood cholesterol that's actually leaked out with the, the watery part of the blood. The watery part has been reabsorbed by the retina, leaving behind the, the lipids and the blood fats, which take a lot longer to reabsorb, so they build up. So this is almost like a line of salt damp um, in a building. The, um, the, we've got more photos of uh, the other conditions like retinal detachment and I'll explain how that actually works in the eye. So once again, this is a blown up shot of a normal eye. Well, at least I hope it's normal because I actually, um, I'm not quite sure where Ben got this image from, but it's actually me. I recognise that blood vessel as mine. <laughs> um, and this is a, a blown up view of that other photo that we were talking about. So this gentleman um, came in to see us um, uh, um, because he was concerned about the vision in the other eye. Um, he'd actually driven um, across Adelaide to come down to the clinic at the university. Um, this being his better eye, um, he was four lines above what, he, what the legal standard for driving was when he actually came to the clinic. Um, so we had to tell him to leave his car and get somebody to pick it up. But he, you know, this isn't something, um, he'd noticed a problem three days before. This is something that's been running for months and months and months. Um, the extension to this story is this gentleman self-confessed as a bad diabetic, um, not as in difficult control. He wasn't terribly concerned about his own control. He, um, he hadn't actually done what he'd been told, and he freely admitted that, and still does. I still see him quite regularly. So, um, those changes that we've talked about so far, with the um, blood actually leaking out of the blood vessels, they're the changes that can be quite marked, but don't actually impact greatly on vision until they've been there for quite some time. The thing that actually steals vision from people with diabetes is swelling at their macula. So swelling at their central vision, fluid seeping into the central vision and actually lifting it away from where it should be. And that's what's happening here. 
um, and there might be a little bit encroaching here. So we know that there's fluid near the central vision because the central vision's there and all these blood lipids are telling us that there has been fluid going into the, the central part of the vision um, and it's, some of it's being reabsorbed but the lipids are, be, are building up. When, when we're actually inspecting this, because we've got fluid building up in, under a person's central vision, it actually changes the contour. Um, so the, we can actually, with, um, this up here is a slit lamp, and by using a lens with the slit lamp, because we've got both eyes going through that device, we can actually pick up the change in contour. So this area would actually be raised, which you can't see on a photo because it's only two-dimensional. So where things have really changed for my profession in the care of people with diabetes is a thing called optical coherence tomography. I hope you're taking notes because you will be tested on this. I am a university lecturer. Um, this, once again, this is what a normal retina looks like. This dip here is right at the macula. So that's the foveal pit. And you can see that we've got quite regular layers. And the topmost layer is the nerves that are actually running to the optic nerve. And right at the back is actually all the cells that pick up the light. I was talking about fluids seeping under your central vision. That's what the, all these pockets are. They're actually pockets of blood fluid that have actually seeped and, and are disrupting the organisation. And because of this disruption, that's what causes a reduction in vision. So another stage of diabetic retinopathy is new blood vessels growing. Um, and this harks back to, this is what we're trying to prevent in the eye, but in other parts of the body, this is what they're going to try to encourage. And there'll be ways to do it. Um, so, VEGF is a, a marker that the body produces quite naturally and it's tissues that are being starved of oxygen or, or nutrition actually start producing this marker to actually ask for the cavalry to come in. And the cavalry in most parts of our body are new blood vessels. All this crazy network of blood vessels are ones that shouldn't be there. So it resolves the problem and it is actually providing more nutrition and more oxygen to the area but the problem is new blood vessels um, don't contain the blood. They don't restrict the blood the, the way mature blood vessels do. So they're leakier. They release a lot of other things. And it's the spilling of the water onto the electrical circuit scenario. And they can leak quite extensively. And that's, that's all blood straight out of blood vessels that have is actually leaked into the jelly in front of the retina. Um, so that, that has a devastating effect on per, a person's vision. Um, the gentleman that I was talking about before, what prompted him to, to go to his doctor on the Monday was he woke up and he had a black band across his, his central vision. And it was a puddle of blood that extended all the way across his central vision. Um, when we see this, this is where we get on the phone and get you into somewhere like the eye department at FMC um, or the RA, you know, preferably in a couple of days because that's not helpful but we definitely don't want it to turn into that. As the body cleans up that blood that's leaked out of blood vessels, 
um, there's scar tissue that's formed. And this cobweb appearance is actually scar tissue. You can actually see new blood vessels there and there. But as the scar tissue matures, it actually shrinks like a scar on your skin. And this blood vessel here is one of the, the natural blood vessels of the eye, and it should be actually going up around here. But the scar tissue has actually picked it up and dragged it. So if this is um, left to its own devices, it will actually pull the retina away from the back of the eye. Um, and surgically, they can actually go in and, and remove this tissue. So the treatments that we've got at the moment um, is um, panretinal photocoagulation, um, which sounds horrible. Um, it's not terribly pleasant to go through. Um, and anti-VEGF injections. They are the same injections that are used in certain cases of macular degeneration. Um, and it's only recently that um, Medicare actually acknowledged the fact that this drug worked so well in, in, di in the treatment of diabetes, and it's listed under Medicare and under the um, PBS, the Pharmaceutical ben Benefit Scheme, um, for diabetes, as well as macular degeneration. So panretinal photocoagulation, um, What it's, it's trying to maintain your central vision. So if we're getting a lot of blood vessels growing because there isn't enough oxygen and nutrition being supplied to the retina by the existing blood vessel array, the easiest way to manage that is to reduce the load, reduce the amount of demand for oxygen inside the eye. And the way a surgeon does that is with a laser. So all of these little dots are actually laser burns. And what they've done is they've functionally killed the retina, so it's not asking for anything anymore. And that's why they've kept the, the central area clear. They're trying to preserve your good vision. The problem with doing this is you've got tunnel vision because all of this area is no longer seeing. And this is a more magnified view of, of what the, the retinal burns look like. So um, a, a, an anti-VEGF injection is actually an injection in the eye. The next slide has a photo of it. So if you don't want to look, turn away now. So the, this process, the, it's working directly against, we'll move on. <laughs> so the reason why we're getting the fluid leakage, the reason why we're getting the blood vessels growing into the eye is because the body's producing this chemical called VEGF. Anti-VEGF is exactly what it sounds. It actually couples with the VEGF and stops it from actually telling the blood vessels to start producing more blood vessels. So it's not a one-shot wonder. Um, because we haven't done anything to actually reduce the need for extra nutrition and oxygen inside the eye, Quite often, people have to go through a period of multiple injections. Quite often, in the early stages, it's every month, and then they push it out to every three months. For some reason, which people we, we don't actually have an understanding of as yet, for some reason, the eye seems to find its own equilibrium. And after about 18 months, two years, people don't need any more injections, even though we haven't done anything to to solve the underlying problem of there's not enough nutrition or not enough oxygen getting to the tissues. Um, when it comes to, to diabetes and eyes, because vision um, 
impacts on people's life so much. There are quite a lot of historical um, studies that um, inform the way we do things and inform a lot of the, the treatments and suggestions for, for people with diabetes. And a lot, of the, a lot of the really good studies have been done in the UK and the cynical um, suggestion is the UK, like Australia, because the government funds um, health care, preventing diabetes or um, managing diabetes better actually has a budgetary effect. So some of the big studies, and they're all now, you know, pushing 40 years old, unfortunately. Um, they, um, they had two different groups of what they had conventional control in the 80s and more intensive control. Um, and that showed that tighter control of your HbA1c um, actually had a significant effect on uh, tighter, more intensive in insulin um, actually had a tighter control on HbA1c. One of the most surprising things with this study, I'm a bit trigger happy at the moment, um, is people stayed in the study. Like in normal um, controlled studies, you expect like a 40% dropout. And these were really long studies, and virtually everybody stayed in them. Um, the, the thing that actually came out of this study that is helpful for the people in, in the room is if you've had poor control and you suddenly go on tighter control, so a change in your medication a change in what you're doing, um, adverse effects actually can initially go up. So the rates of um, diabetic retinopathy or worsening of diabetic retinopathy in a person who's had poor blood sugar control and then suddenly goes on to really good um, blood sugar control happens in about 13% of cases. So that's not, the message isn't not to tighten control. The message is if there's a change in your medication, get your eyes checked. Um, so another big study from the, the UK, once again, it's quite dated. Um, the, a fairly small change in the HbA1c's um, decreased the, the microvascular complications by 25%. The cranial nerve palsies, that double vision, is a direct artefact of microvascular complications. So a fairly small change in, in the control of your HbA1c um, can have a big impact on the sorts of complications you're likely to deal with. So, so tighter control, actually, you're, you're a third less likely to have problems with your eyes with um, uh, retinopathy. Um, you're 50% less likely to have a big impact on the way you're seeing. So from your side of things, 50% less likely to have the way you see the world be impacted on. Um, and a 44% reduction in the risk of stroke. One of the big things that came out of this, this study was blood pressure control, which we've all talked about, um, is the thing that doesn't seem to naturally link with diabetes, but 
di the likelihood of you getting complications from your diabetes is significantly less if your blood pressure is well controlled. So there is a fairly good chance that your GP might want to get a, a fairly tight control on your blood pressure, even though it's not that bad, because you're diabetic. <coughs> so, to say the same things that everybody else has been saying, diet and lifestyle. Um, so, watching what you eat. 150 minutes of exercise a week, um, losing 7% of your body mass. Um, this was done in a group of glucose intolerance, so pre-diabetic patients. 60% 60 60 less likely to actually convert to diabetes by um, changing lifestyle. Whilst if they were just put on you know, the standard diabetic control of metformin, 30%. So <coughs> diet, diet and lifestyle is probably much more effective than pharmaceuticals. <laughs> so watching your HbA1c's, um, your blood glucose levels, really has a, a solid impact on the risks of changes with your eyes and blindness. Um, better control of your blood pressure is also going to impact on those things. And fairly small changes in lifestyle can have a big impact on your, on your diabetic care. So, when you, you front up for a diabetic exam, a diabetic eye exam, what should you expect? And what are we likely to ask you? So, to fully inspect all the blood vessels inside the eye, we need to have a big window. The pupil, the dark part, and the center of the colored part of your eye is the window. So the bigger we make that, the more we can see and the more reliably we can see inside your eye. Um, and it's done with a drop. And it's a drop that works on dogs as well. <laughs> um, there's a few different techniques that we, we'd use. Um, the first one and the most helpful one for looking at your central vision, the macula, and spotting small changes in blood vessels related to diabetes is, once again, done with a slit lamp and a lens. Um, our old way of examining the health of the eyes is a handheld instrument called a direct ophthalmoscope, which is this device here. And it gives us a really magnified view, but we can't see depth. And because we've got such a magnified view, it's very hard to actually see things in context, see where blood vessels are going, see changes in blood vessels. And there's a fairly high chance that with small changes, we might look over the top, we might miss those parts of the eye. Because we're actually looking for a change in contour, just taking a photograph isn't enough um, because we don't get that sense of depth. And oh, those things that we've just talked about, they're all covered by Medicare. About 98% of my profession bulk bill. So all those things that we've, we've talked about, in the average optometrist in a commercial practice, you waive your green card and there shouldn't be any additional expense. Unfortunately, things like the OCT, which gives us a lot more information, isn't covered by Medicare. Some practices don't charge, some practices do. The real advantage of this device is it can see changes down to a tenth of a, hu a thickness of a human hair. So it sees things that general inspection won't pick up. 
One of the big changes that's, that's happened recently in the last two years is we can actually map the blood vessels by using an OCT. So the OCT actually picks up red blood cells that are moving, and from that it actually maps the blood vessel array inside the eye. These fronds here are actually new vessels caused by diabetes. And the reason why we're getting that frond of blood vessels is you'll notice that there's no blood vessels in this area. So the diabetes has actually killed off those smaller blood vessels. So the body's responded by producing new vessels. This blob here, and we've got a few other bright blobs, are actually um, the arteries, the walls of the arteries weakening and actually expanding. Like a, if you bl blow up an old tractor tire and there's a weak spot in the tractor tire, it'll well out. That's what happens with blood vessels in diabetes. So the big changes that's going to come into diabetic care is they're using, they're already using photographs of the inside of the eye to use artificial intelligence to analyse the blood vessel array to see if there's any changes consistent with any condition. Now that we can actually map the blood vessels as a whole, the next stage is actually diagnosing risk of um, diabetic retinopathy from these sorts of images. We've, for a very long time, we've been able to get maps like this. Um, and it's a thing called a fluorescein angiogram. Um, where in a hospital they'll in, inject a person with a bright yellow dye that glows bright green under blue light and they'll take a series of photographs. Um, it has an advantage over this uh, in that it will pick up puddles of blood and it'll pick up the, the watery fluid leaking out of the blood vessels. It has the disadvantage of you're bright yellow for the next 12 hours. Um, most people vomit after the injection and some people are allergic to fluorescein so they, you can actually die from the procedure. Tends to have a poor effect on one's day. So the advantage of this sort of technology is ex it's accessible, it's non-invasive, a scan like this takes about 10 seconds. What is a, an optometrist likely to ask you? We always want to know what your, your blood sugar control has been like. So your HbA1c, your BSL or BGL. Um, we're going to, we're going to exp, um, dilate your pupils. So bring a driver. If you've got sunglasses, bring sunglasses, especially in summer, because by dilating the pupil, we've basically put the world onto high beam. You walk outside, your eyes won't adapt to the change in brightness. Um, and most, it varies from person to person, but most people find that they're not comfortable with their vision for a couple of hours after having their pupils dilated. The um, standard practice is to write a letter back to your GP because your general practitioner is the linchpin of your care. If you've got an endocrinologist that you're seeing regularly, we'd normally flick them a letter as well, with your permission, of course. Um, because this is something that we have to review through the rest of your days, there should also be a discussion of when do we want to see you next. Um, the guidelines um, from the government um, for early diabetes is every two years. Um, there is a Medicare item number specifically for eye exams in a diabetic patient with dilation 
and we can actually use that code as frequently as, as we need to on a given patient. So if there's a need for us to see you every two months, um, Medicare will actually pay for all of those consults. Um, so the best things that you can do. Um, find find a, an optometrist that you trust and get your eyes seen to regularly. Um, even though I said that we don't actually expect problems with eyes after about 10 or 15 years, most people with type 2 diabetes were diagnosed on a day, but we don't know how long before then they actually, things started going ar awry. Um, control your blood glucose levels as, as well as you can. You know, you probably all have your GPs harping on about tighter control. I understand that it's, it's difficult, but any improvement that you can get is an improvement. Um, if your GP's not already keeping an eye on your cholesterol levels and your blood pressure, ask them to do so. Um, and don't be shy, you know, ask. Ask all of your healthcare professionals. Um, diabetes falls into the, the basket of a lot of different professions. Um, unfortunately, those professions tend not to be good at communicating to each other. So you ask the questions. Take control. Um, now it's time for the shameless plug. Um, Because the changes that we expect in diabetes, most of them with eyes, most of them don't have symptoms, you can't rely on, I'm seeing well, my eyes feel good, therefore I won't bother getting them checked. So turn up, go through the process. Um, the outcome, like with most things, the outcomes are significantly better if things are detected early. Um, and the shameless plug is, I used to work at a, a place called Flinders Vision. Um, the university rebadged it only a few months ago, and it's now called Flinders Health to Go. It's a university clinic. Um, it's mainly staffed by students, supervised by people like myself, but we also are starting to offer a whole series of other services. And yes, we have OCTs. Um, that was a shameless plug, I do apologise. <laughs> um, as we were saying before, do everything that you can con to control your blood glucose levels. Try not to get disheartened, things go up and down. It's never too late to actually get tighter control. Um, and keep working on it. Um, you're half as likely to have problems with your eyes if you've got better control of your blood glucose levels. As we've just talked about, blood pressure is important. Ask your GP. If they're not already doing so, ask. As I was just saying, there's a whole raft of different people that feed into the care. And communication between health professionals isn't great, unfortunately. So it's almost you're in a better position if you take control of that communication. Um, ask for people to actually send letters to your GP. Like I said, your GP or your endocrinologist, depending on what level you're at, is the linchpin. So tell them to actually, can you send a report about what you've found? Because it better informs your GP and better informs the endocrinologist to be in the best position to look after you the best way they can. And, you know, optometry is just a small part of that team. Thank you.